good art or fine art is as much about trying to get people to think as it is about trying to have good technique or skill. And this, of course, is directly related to the art of teaching and my mother's teaching method. My mother, Nina Stowell, was an art teacher and Montessori teacher, and both of those theories affected her teaching method. The theory of art, or art theory, which I use as a general all-encompassing term or category that one might study in school as a subject, and Montessori theory of education, which, although a subgenre, certainly has as many styles as it does teachers who represent it, or students who learn from it. And of course, when we practice a method, it becomes part of us uh, subconsciously, even if we might uh, not do it for a while, like riding a bicycle, we can, to some extent, pick it back up later, or remember elements from it, or do things intuitively as a result of that training. So that is the introduction to my memorial exhibit dedicated to my mother, Nina Stowell, titled Expression is Art, subtitle Everyone is an Artist, and special thanks to Mary Mannix and the Frederick Library for hosting the exhibit and this talk. My mother was born Mary Evelina Manusi, and I don't know about your families, but some members of my family seem to have a tradition where they give a child a first name, but then they use the middle name or a nickname uh, by which to call them for the rest of their lives. So my mother was nicknamed Evelina, which then became shortened to Nina, and the rest is history. She got a degree from the University of Florida in art education, married my father in the 1970s, and they founded Stowell Galleries and a bunch of small businesses, including the Harpers Ferry Montessori School, which I will talk about later. But there she was called Miss Nina, and most people knew my mother as Nina. As it says on the poster that I made for this show at the entry to the hallway of the first floor of the Frederick Library, this is dedicated to Nina Stowell, local art educator and artist who passed away this year. Her main legacy as a Montessori and art teacher was to include everyone in the arts. No value is lost by expressing lives, no matter how outside of society they may be. Our collective show includes art by Nina, her students, and many others representing various styles and genres. For my mother, the value in art was not some subjective elitist arbitration, although she did judge art shows and grade students, the value in art for my mother was really about the human value, the value of sharing, the value of compassion, the value of recognizing other living entities as being just as worthy to practice the thing that she loved as much as she was worthy of it. So although she got paid in order to pay her own bills, the value of teaching art 
was an emotional reward. It was something felt. Just as the value of good art was not so much about the dollar sign that might be attached to it, but about the feeling that we get upon viewing it or contemplating it or doing it. So already, just within the threshold, just entering into the exhibit, you can see I'm touching on multiple subjects, trying to get people to think, and here we go. There will be any number of digressions as we move along the exhibit, looking at the cases and the different displays, the different pieces of art, but that is the point. Uh, the point of the exhibit is to get us to reflect upon not only the life of my mother, but uh, students around the world. All of us who learned from someone else and who try to practice uh, what we love and try to include as many other people in the joy of art as we can. This exhibit could have easily been called The Joy of Art, but I felt it was likely that that was copyrighted because it sounds so much like The Joy of Cooking or any number of other uh, subjects using that as a title. So as with writing and other subjects, the concept of ownership inevitably comes up as to who actually owns an idea or a representation of that idea, or a manifestation of expression. In court cases, it really is relative to the money at stake and the opinions of those involved as to what is similar, influenced by something, or a copy of something, and whether that is or should be allowable. On the poster, you can see two images, one by Chris Robinson of a book, which I thought was appropriate for a library, and one of the bell tower at Baker Park, which is where people can meet up. It's a it's a local icon. A recognizable feature of the landscape. And as an architect and historic preservationist, I love this building and identify it with it because of the Banner School, which Mother taught art at, and we would play around the bell tower. The vertical landscape painting beside the poster is based on my fantasy book series and other books which I was able to sell here at the library local authors book day, which Mary Mannix is also in charge of. So praise again upon Mary Mannix. The next alcove over has the egg tree, which I painted on a shipping container, which was in good shape and had the generic sticker fragile in the center, which I used for another piece and then I felt was appropriate for an egg and uh, a symbol of nature. The irony or humor here for me was using an industrial pre-manufactured uh, piece that would normally be discarded or not considered to be art as a piece of art that represents nature or the wilderness and other organisms besides humans. And now I feel it is appropriate to mention the debate about whether art is merely a human product or technique, uh, like artisan craftsmanship or artistry or artificial productions, 
but uh, of course, I believe that there are many other species that express themselves and exhibit practices of building and collecting and showing things off, weaving and constructing. But you could also have any number of other discussions uh, based on an egg inside a tree in a woodland scene. Uh, you know, an egg with fragile marked on it. And, you know, what does this mean to you? Eggs, of course, being representative of birth, creation, life, babies, and food. Which is a segue to the next painting hanging across the room here by Kathy Wilkin. It was on display in our house for many years and was part of different shows that we had for Kathy. Uh, but there's another painting, which is not here, that had a baby bird in a teacup and humans uh, around, you know, the breakfast table. So it was a very odd, surreal scene. But Kathy confirmed for me recently that indeed she does put birds in many of her works of art, whether painting or collage. And this one on display in the library has birds and flower patterns and various other things which look like they're cut out of paper, but actually this is delicately done with acrylic. And there are some artists like Kathy who amaze me with their skill with very tiny paintbrushes. I'm assuming that's how they do it. If not, maybe it's elves that come out at midnight. I don't know. Also on the surface of the wall, I have a blank canvas framed that says in small print, express yourself, leave space for others. So I'm trying to encourage other people to do artwork within limits, <laughs> uh, you know, con confining the graffiti to within the frame, but, you know, trying to engage the audience. And on the other side, I taped up printouts, copies, newsletters, various notes from my mother, uh, from mainly the Montessori school or letters to friends and family. My mother did lessons for her art classes. She would often do examples of the projects that she would have students do. And when studying famous artists, eventually she began doing her own versions of Van Gogh's Starry Night. And they were basically of Harper's Ferry. So these have a very special place in our hearts. Those of us who love Harper's Ferry and my mother left one canvas less than half finished. She started it and I finished it while I was in her house after she died cleaning up and to get my mind off of the depressing aspects of handling my mother's estate. I finished this painting which has led to this other painting here where I combined elements from one of Kathy's paintings that was above my bed where my mother hung it. You see, Kathy Wilkin and other artists lived with us over the years. They rented rooms from us. They came to visit just like family on holidays or for special events. And we kept their art in our house as part of our collection which we sometimes purchased or sometimes was on loan. Another friend of the family artist was Tor Carlson, and we had a large collection of his work in our house, which inspired me since childhood 
from landscapes to fantasy scenes and abstract paintings as well. He mainly worked in oil paint. I mainly use acrylic, but I love trying to do tributes to my favorite artists, which are not meant to copy them or steal from them, but build on the body of work that they did and to add to their memory rather than detract or take away from it, as people often think is the case when we copy or run the risk of being accused of stealing or ruining someone else's artwork. My mother taught me from an early age that when you love someone, you can do art with them, and the lines upon the page or the brush strokes on the canvas are or can be as much yours as theirs. The lines between the two people can become blurred, especially the harder that you work on combining styles and cooperating or emulating or bringing attention to what someone else did or started that you have borrowed or are paying tribute to and modifying in your own way as we all do even if it is just by the affectation of evaluation or interpretation. When quoting someone else, inevitably there are going to be variations or changes to the original thing which I am trying to preserve or copy. This painting of a cloud I love because it shows the nebulous nature of reality and how just when you think something is a certain way it will inevitably change or your perception of it can change with the wind or on a whim. This elf is a fantasy portrait but it is based on a real model and photographer who does color her hair with these rainbow colors and love nature and so uh, we love this painting. We as in my group, the Sustainable Cooperative for Organic Development, SCOD, are a loose-knit group of acquaintances or friends and some of us keep in touch over the years and try to do some projects together or at least to share information towards various sustainable cooperative organic goals. So one of my books published with Scott was called Bog Peeps Beautiful Organic Garden People and this is a piece from that book and it is expressing those things about our lives or humanity that we think are worth sustaining or preserving. This painting was done by a beautiful artist in England who loves nature. This is a portrait I did of Donald Green near his house. He is a musician friend of mine that grew up with me. We went to the same school and we've done some collaboration since then, and his relatives went to Storr College, which was the first black college, and across the way you will see some black history figures that my mother did portraits of for the book that is on display upstairs. Jax is a well-known artist in Harper's Ferry who painted these lovely landscape scenes locally conserved by the Methodist Church and the National Park Service. My father worked for the National Park Service as an exhibit designer and interpretive architect for many years 
So he traveled around the country and worked at various national parks, and he worked with me on my thesis project to try to design a sustainable village using a local site, and that is what this documents. And you'll see a photograph of the graveyard, which is one of the iconic locations in Harper's Ferry from which to paint, draw, or simply gaze, much like Jefferson's Rock. Also a photograph of my mother with one of her Starry Night paintings. Why do we have famous artists? How do some artists become famous and others or most of us do not? Vincent van Gogh was a very troubled man who had many problems and died tragically. Yet, we celebrate him as perhaps one of the most popular artists to this day. There are reasons for this. And what is it about his style that is appealing to some of us or many of us? For me, it touches upon special needs and those of us who suffer from various disabilities or illnesses, which poverty is inevitably made worse by. Vincent sold only one painting during his lifetime. Although he was recognized after his life, Perhaps one of the good aspects of social media today is that we can begin to start to recognize people or average people, perhaps with below average IQ or skill level during their lives, rather than waiting till after their lives. If they happen to later win the lottery and are recognized for being that one out of a million people who just had that certain special gift that only elites can recognize. That is certainly a wonderful thing. However, not all of us are going to win the popular contest in politics or networking people skills or selling ourselves. Yet, perhaps our lives can be worth living and have some value to society, albeit through artwork or recognition of innate rights. My mother certainly thought you were special and she would make these handcrafted cards to give you. The Harper's Ferry Gap view of the Shenandoah and Potomac River are also painted here with the gray cat and violets by my mother. These two paintings I did of fantasy plants were purchased by a patron and classmate friend of mine on loan from his personal collection. My mother would spend hours, often with the help of my father or me, hanging art shows for Jefferson County, West Virginia, and the Banner School in Maryland. This photograph shows a wall full of her students' artwork. These pink note cards were made by my mother for instructing parents and assistants who helped her teach. This one says, work. A child's work is the process of self-development. Must be positive experiences. His great work is the building of a personality. So art work is process of self-development, basically, is what that's saying. That when we do art, we are working through issues and expressing who we are, whether it represents us or who we think we are not. 
many other artists who came before me influenced me in some of my favorite genres or topics, including J.R.R. Tolkien and other fantasy authors and artists, even in cartoon series from Disney or other companies like The Gummy Bears. And these paintings that I did here are tributes as much to my own skill and the subject as the artists who influenced me. Chris Robinson's wonderful paintings here have an expressionistic tarot card style with features like the earth as a time bomb, a leaf, stars, flames of fire, and heart medicine. We have some pagan paintings here influenced by Tor Carlson and Chris has told me many of his influences as well. You can see goddesses and druids and elemental spiritual beings that have either fallen or risen, died and been reborn. And across the hall again, we see my elemental painting of the four elements, air, fire, water, earth, swirling together in a spiral like the ancient Celts depicted in their artwork and drum circle people in Baker Park. This painting is of two pre-Raphaelite women with a moon drum by the bridge over Carroll Creek and a willow tree from a photograph. The painting is digital filmation or rotoscope style. This large glass case has six paintings by Chris Robinson of Shepherdstown with three smaller paintings and three sculptures at the bottom. The main painting is a woman drinking from a mug with a broken heart on it. Again, very detailed expressionism. His artwork is amazing. I especially like these heavy metal sculptures of the hammer and wrench and what looks to me like a heart. In this open alcove, he has two amazing modern Basquiat style expressionist paintings behind which I have a Dadaist empty frame hidden from view. Chris is a very independent, brilliant thinker, but he agrees with me that we are influenced by others we are around and things we like or that make us feel strongly one way or another. And here you can see what looks to me to be a soul leaving a body, or at least a pale figure over a somewhat darker tan body. The way he treats the color patterns is very labyrinthine like mazes and different contraptions and abstract inventions within surreal impressionistic designs. Moving upstairs, taking the beautiful spiral staircase to the back of the library at the Maryland Room, there are three more cases. The main center one has two abstract works by my father, Kip Stowell, and a horse skull with Celtic Native American designs on it from a Missouri farm, which I painted in Iowa. A photograph of a jack-o'-lantern by Sharon Garvey, a portrait of Rasputin. We had shows of Sharon's work in Stowell Galleries. 
a goddess painting inspired by local artists like Roxy and others, a famous Haitian artist who we featured in our collection because he was a friend of the family, Bernard Sejourn, did this wonderful carving of an alien-looking being with a red half and a green half. This ornate candlestick made of metal was found on the bottom of a lake by my father, which we painted and used for many years. This sign for architecture as art, another show which we had years ago in Martinsburg at the Borman Art Center, which is reminiscent of the art shows at the Entler in Shepherdstown as well. This Black Bear Miwok Indian drum I purchased from the maker in Yosemite National Park when I lived there working. I attended a powwow in the lodge and had communal breakfast with natives from different tribes in the morning after the all-night ritual. These SCOD architectural models include various types and an echo house, the largest one having a sod roof, reminiscent of famous architect Frank Lloyd Wright, and this small birdhouse castle reminiscent of the castle tool shed playhouse in my backyard that my father and I built, and birdhouses. Architecture for birds that they can put their own architecture in, which are their nests. And even if we do not make something ourselves, we can make art of it by painting the surface of it or showcasing it. This is what promoters and managers do is they say, hey, look at this. This is art. This is worth paying attention to. And even if the artists themselves are humble or doesn't want to be recognized, uh, a promoter can make other people see what they do as art, even if the artist themselves feels ashamed of it or doesn't want to call it art. In the case to the left, various other artists are on display, including Marie from Thermont, Marie Maccabee, who does amazing watercolors of cat people and is a survivalist, despite a crippling disability. Andy Sweeney weaves these brilliant yarn mandalas. This one is the Eye of Solomon. Again, another local artist. He happens to be recognized internationally because of the fan base for South American and Central American mandalas. I don't know that much about them. I imagine uh, there's many in Mexico too. I'm not sure. I just imagine everyone south of the border has known about these forever and I'm new to learning about them. My artology book, I did for my mother's art portfolio. And Chris Robinson has various prints on display here and another abstract expressionist painting. And the final case is a collection of notebooks, scrapbooks, and journals by my mother about her teaching method. Photographs of her classrooms with notes, and her Montessori workshop training, various lessons and projects, and use of sensorial Montessori 
tools or materials. Speaking of which, it is wonderful that we can, in this modern age, print our various works of art on various manufactured materials. To enjoy common art in common everyday life. And finally, I presented this to Mary Mannix, my design for a Maryland Athenaeum for archives, because I think she deserves it. So thank you again, Mary.